We, we obviously needed no introduction. So, hello, I'm Anne-Marie Orange. I'm Head of Product Delivery for Call Credit. And I'm Chris Cavell, but I'm Head of Product Delivery for Call Credit. <laughs> Therein lies the, the question. <laughs> There's actually three of us, but only two can make it today. Many, many product delivery um, heads of in Call Credit. But that, that's what this presentation is all about. Because we've transformed ourselves over the last year in Call Credit from a, a, product, a project delivery organization to a product delivery organization. So we, new roles were created, and so now we're aligned down our lines of business. So I'm head of product delivery for fraud and ID. Product delivery for credit and consumer business. And the person that's not here is, is our marketing business. The thing that we want to talk about today, which is underpinned here, is about empowerment of the development team. So why we made the change. Just out of interest, how many here would say that they're still operating in, in a project-centric way in their organizations? <laughs> you're not allowed, you, to, you're say not that, allowed to answer. <laughs> You're okay, so, so most would feel that they've already moved then to, to product-centric in terms of how, how you currently structured and how you currently work? Yeah? Or is there, there might be another model that we don't know about? Yeah, there might be. <laughs> we like this one. But for us, this, this was key. Our business, and probably most of your businesses, are, are software businesses. So if the heart of the business is about software and its, its entire reason for existing, is to create good software, then you need to put your development teams at the heart of everything that you do, which for us, project models just didn't work because you were building up teams, ripping them down, moving to more of a product-centric world where teams stay together and are bought into the long-term productivity of a product and the knowledge stays in the team. That works much better for us and I assume for your organizations if you've moved to that as well. So that's what we want to talk you through, so our journey which is still ongoing, we're not at the end of it, That's true. as you wouldn't expect us to be. So I've got the clicker, so if it goes wrong. <laughs> right, so here is our product backlog for today. But we've prioritized, and so this is the stuff that we want to talk about. Brief introduction, I want to talk about the old structure, how we, how we used to be structured, bit of a history lesson, introduction to Agile, expanding out into Kaunas, listening to our people, what was wrong with what we were doing, aiming then for a target model, how we wanted to change. We knew we couldn't change on our own, and we brought a product focus. We'll talk about a top-down approach, and hopefully what you'll find interesting are some practical experiences from, from our journey over this last year. And then to talk about where we are now. So, off we go into our sprint one. Our sprint one goal, get the audience up to speed on where we came from. So, Call Credit, a growing company, in a growing business. We've grown phenomenally over the past 10, 15 years. But our growth was around a number of key products. Now, that seems a bit, a bit wrong that, you know, all that time our growth was around products. The trouble is, they were, uh, we did all the changes to those products in projects. So we had the business driving product projects to change our products. And of course, as, as Bo said right at the beginning of the day, when you're only driven by the business driving the features, you end up with tons of technical debt. What did Bo say? Keep the old crap and it kills the velocity. That is exactly what we found. So our, our products were gaining new features, gaining new features, but they were also gaining technical debt. It took us longer and longer to release every single change to live. I, I, I wanted to do a graph, but I, I scared myself looking at the figures of how uh, the, the increment between releases on some of our bigger, bigger products. So, the, the, the good thing about that time was that we were operating in, in a can-do approach. And we, you, you need to keep that, I think, through, and keep that focus through all of what we're talking about. Our people are always trying to do 
the right thing, and they're trying to do the best thing. So, around 2009, 2010, we, we realized we, we needed to change. And so, we entered the matrix. So, this will be really, really familiar to, to lots of you, I'm sure. We, we organized ourselves absolutely along these lines. Projects, project A, project B, roughly, roughly related to our products, but not always. And then we were functions across the side. You know, we had a testing function, QA, we called it at the time. Development function with head of development. BA function, head of business analysis. So this was, this was the structure. It's in all the books. It's recognized. It's valid. And, and we tried to make it work. Now, of course, there's pros and cons to, uh, to all, all structures. I like the matrix. It's cool. It's cool. So the pros of matrix management, strong skills development. It, it's, it's, it's inevitable when you've got a head of development, a head of testing, that they are going to drive those good skills. So our developers learned new skills. Our, our testers tested in the right way bringing out those, those good skills and nurturing those skills. Of course, it's flexible. Um, it's flexible in terms of flexible for the projects. It works well for consultancy. We, we, we almost had that mentality. The people we brought in to help us with this were from consultancies, and they had that consultancy mentality. So they're the good things. Agent Smith tells us a lot about the bad things of uh, matrix management. We lost our product knowledge. What a nightmare. We, we're, a, we're a business relying on key products, and we lost our knowledge. Developers were on a project, start it up, do your code, finish your project, off onto something else. We didn't have a continuity of, of developer maintaining knowledge of a product. People were moved frequently. We, we invented a uh, transfer window meeting. So every week, we would gather together, head of dev, head of testing, and the, uh, the business representatives. Every week, they'd come and say, right then, I need more people on this project. It's going slower. We need more people. And so we would drag poor developers and testers off their project that they're working on over into a completely different project that they, they didn't know. They had to start themselves up again. And as a, as, a, as a developer, as a tester, that lack of continuity was really, really hard. And of course, we've heard it so much today in all the talks. There was little ownership of the technical debt. If you're on a, if you're on a project and you're being driven for your deadline, get it done, you, you get it done. And you get it done quick, don't you? I'm not, I'm not supporting that code. I'm not going to be the one opening that code up for the, for the next project. I'm not worried about technical debt, so there's no, no, no ownership. A big, big con. So it was around this time that we went agile. We went agile. We, 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 we got it. We, we really, really got it. So dev teams working in an agile way. We even formalized it. We, we, we bought DSDM a term. I have to look up what DSDM, dynamic systems dev method. We bought a method. We trained our developers. We trained our testers. We had the DSDM roles, team lead, you know, system developer, system team. It was ace. But we forgot to tell the business that we were running in this agile way. So we were demanding, yeah, we need a, a foundation document. We need feasibility documents which describe what you want as a bit. And the business didn't know and couldn't understand that they had this responsibility. And they had a, a big part to play in the, in the agile journey, in, that, in, those, in the development method. And so there were just constant battles between the developers. You know, we, 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 we've got this method. We're, we're developing agile. And the business, no, 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 fixed scope, fixed cost, fixed time. When's it going to be delivered? Give me a date. Give Battles reigned across 2011, 2012. <sighs> it was hard. Around that time, we decided, yeah, we need, we need to expand. We need more developers. We'd, we'd drained the leads market of, of every quality developer and tester 
in the whole of Leeds. So we moved out to Kaunas. Now, that caused its own problems. You can imagine the poor developers and testers in Leeds. <gasps> they're, opening up a, they're opening up a dev shop in Kaunas. We're not going to have any jobs anymore. We're all going to be sacked and uh, it's going to be Kaunas forevermore. Hang on, there's, there's something else. Click, click. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> why did we do it? Why did we come, why did we come to Kaunas? You all know. Hang on, you lot, aren't, you lot aren't devs and tests. They're all in the other room. You all know how good that lot are in the other room. You know how good, technically good the development capability is in Kaunas. There were cost efficiencies. No one's going to uh, deny that. Great language skills. You know, we come to a conference in Lithuania and all the talks, well, the majority of the talks are in English. Great language skills. The culture is quite familiar. It's, it, 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 it feels very, very familiar to the Brits coming out here. And it's not too far away. When we opened the Kaunas office, Simona, what, four hours? Kaunas to Leeds, door to door. You could go into work in Kaunas in the morning and you could finish your working day in Leeds in the afternoon. It was great. Now, unfortunately, there are no direct flights from Leeds to Kaunas. So, you know, minimum door to door is eight hours. But we, we can cope with that. So, how do we integrate? How do we integrate the teams? We did it in, we went whole hog. We went all in for integration. So we had, every team had people from Kaunas and people from, from the UK in every team. We did our best, every team had a mix. We integrated our line management. We've got uh, dev leads, test leads in Kaunas, line managing people in leads. We had leaders in leads, line managing people in Kaunas. We were, we were integrating hard. And we wanted to integrate the, the business values. And, th and that was a big part. We're, Core Credit is, is actually, right at the beginning, a family business. And there are still those family values running through Core Credit. And we've got a very strong people ethic. We, we want our people to do well. We want them to thrive within, within Core Credit. So there was a strong integration in the business culture as well. But the thing we got really, really good at was collaboration. If any, any of you saw uh, this, this talk last year, it was all about how we were doing collaboration with our screens in both environments, link, VCs, everything. We were good. We, we, well, we are good at collaboration. So what have we learned in our sprint one? Chris loves the matrix. He's not so keen on the sequels or the organizational structure, but uh, he likes the film. We were organized like that for very good reasons. And at the time, it, 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 was, it was right. We needed a change in the way we were, we were working. We were trying to do the right agile thing. We were trying to work in the right way. And we were race collaborators. That's, that's the big one to learn from Sprint 1. Sprint two, do we need to swap? Oh yeah, yeah, we got to stand under this for the, uh, for the camera. So. <laughs> <laughs> you just wanted to hog it by, by staying here. So sprint two, the goal um, for this session is explain where we want it to be. So the vision, as Chris explained, a lot had been done, but the really vital missing component was we hadn't brought the business with us. So for all the right reasons, a lot of things had been done and changed, but we hadn't brought the business with us, and that was causing issues. So around 2013, am I drifting out? Around 2013, um, that was recognized that we needed to make an even bigger change in terms of how we worked. So we needed to get a vision that was shared. So shared by, by the engineering practice, but it had to be shared by the business as well, from, from the top down. The whole business needed to buy into it for it to be effective. So we talked to everyone. Um, in talking to, to the engineering community, we got an awful lot of feedback in terms of what was working and what wasn't working. So matrix management, generally, we'd probably gone too far. And we'd probably gone too far because we were desperate to integrate Kaunas and Leeds together. 
but that matrix management was causing issues. So if you were a manager, it wasn't really working as effectively as it could. And if you were being managed in that way, you weren't really getting the value out of it either. So really difficult to try and add value into an individual's career if you're actually not working alongside them. So we, we, we needed to look at that and we needed to make sure that we were adding value into, into everyone's career. So, so that was the feedback around matrix management as much as Chris loves the, the theme, it didn't quite fit. Technical debt, we were leaving an awful lot of technical debt behind because of the way we were working in, in the project way. And nobody really wanted to, nobody wanted to leave something behind for their colleagues to have to pick up in a year's time. Nobody comes in to, to do a, a, a bad job. Everybody wants to do the best possible job that they can. So nobody felt good about leaving that tech debt behind. And the constant moving around, so as you, as you spun up a team for a project, generally you're lucky if you've got a year to deliver a project. In spinning a team up, you lost three months in terms of those guys learning to work together, learning knowledge of the product. So every project you're working on, you could assume that three months of that, you, you actually weren't productive. So that didn't help in terms of morale either, because everybody generally wanted to come in to code. We were saying to them, during that startup window, you're going to get little done. So, so that wasn't motivating either. We also wanted to bridge the gap between development and operations, and we wanted to find those operational issues early on in the cycle. So that was something that, that we wanted to address as well. And, and we wanted to, to develop, if we were taking away matrix management, we wanted to develop a strand of strong communities. So building those skills and, and those practices through strong communities of practice, that again was something that, that was fed back very strong to us. We also looked at the market. A lot of this you're not going to invent. You may as well look at what's been done in the market, what's worked, what hasn't worked. And some of these things people are probably familiar with, so the Spotify model. So Tribes, tribes and guilds, similar to scrum teams and, and communities of practice, that, that seemed to be something that we liked. Um, walking skeleton, the DevOps culture, which you'll hear from Ian about in the closing speech later, in terms of the real value that that can add and the cultural change that it brings to the organization as you introduce that culture, and the collaboration and communities of practice. So those were all things that you could, we could see were being used and tested in other organizations and we could draw on that in terms of what was working and what wasn't. The key thing then at the end was to recap where we'd got to. So we'd set a vision, we understood what that vision was. We wanted to be product centric. We didn't know all the detail, but we knew that we wanted to be a product centric organization and that we absolutely, for that to be predictable, for it to be reliable, for it to be something that the business could trust and that that was an important part of setting this vision what was in it for the business we wanted them to be able to trust us so by building that devops culture and building the knowledge in product teams meant that we could be more trusted to meet the demands of the roadmap so that that was really the hook in for the business um, as it always is what's in it what's in it for the business so we had some really big ideas we didn't have all the answers to it but we absolutely knew that it had to be a whole business approach to this, not just something that development wanted to do. Because we'd already made a change. It had worked to some extent, but not completely. It hadn't brought the business with us. So we needed the next change to make sure that it brought the business with us. Sprint three. Understanding the organizational changes in core credit. Yeah, it's yours. There's it's a whole yours. Set of slides, isn't yeah. It? So, <laughs> 2014, 2013. I can't remember the dates. I'm rubbish. A, a big thing happened. Huge thing happened. We were bought by um, a big American. They don't call them venture capitalists when they get that big, do they? Who is it? A finance, um, a financing house, GTCR. And that 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 changed that changed the way of thinking. They dropped in a new um, CEO, Mike Gordon. He came from uh, a company called FICO. From in, Space, by the sounds of it. He dropped they in. dropped in from Space, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so he, he came from a company called FICO, who, who are a, a, a big company in America, doing, doing some similar things to us, but, but in a subtly different way. And he brought a 
very different, uh, different approach with him. He wanted us to be recognized as a, a firm that, that delivers software, whereas we, prior to that, weren't a software company. I, I remember I used to, I used to sit with, with my peers wondering what sort of firm we were. Well, are, we, are we a software firm? Or do we create software? Or, or are we actually a, a sales and marketing firm who just who drive product? Mike brought a much, much clearer vision to, to, to me and, and other members of, uh, of Core Credit. Very soon after Mike arrived from FICO, he brought with him um, uh, David Ross. And so David Ross landed as uh, the CTO, the Chief Technical Officer from space, landed from space. Now, finally, all the things that we've been thinking about, the walking skeleton, the, the, uh, the, the product-focused culture, the, the, the DevOps mentality, suddenly there were two big bosses in Core Credit that were thinking the same as, on, as, on, as us developers on the ground. They were thinking the same. And genuinely, because they were developers. Yeah, yeah, they, they'd come, they'd come from a development background. Yeah, both of them, absolutely. And so, they helped crystallise our vision uh, uh, through 2013. And because they were speaking the same language, and we were, we geared ourselves up to to make these changes. But they, they hadn't quite stuck. We'd never been able to to get over the line with our with our old management team. We'd never been able to quite make all the changes that we wanted to. Suddenly, the doors are open, and we've, we've got a, a management team who are thinking the same as us. And so, very, very quickly, we could start realizing our vision and making some of those big key changes. <laughs> She's throwing them in from space. Right, these, these are our products. So, yeah, we are now a product-focused company. But the key bit from before, where we were trying to be agile and we were, we were doing it ourselves, we brought the business with us. In actual fact, David had the gem of the idea to actually move the product management function out of the business and put it in with us within the delivery function. So now we have got a product management function with product owners. The BAs are part of that product management, product owner community. And so they sit in front of the products. We've got scrum teams doing, um, doing the, the development and the coding. We've got scrum masters helping to, to drive that process, owning the, the agile process within the teams. We've, we've sent a whole swathe of, of, uh, of people within, the, within Core Credit on Scrum courses, and they're, they're, they're understanding that, that joint between the team, the product owner, and the Scrum Master, which is fantastic. And the product owner's gone on the training, which is the key Yeah, yeah, and key that's, that's the time. important thing. The product owner's well aware and getting on that training. So the development teams are aligned to our end products. So those teams stay on those products cycle after cycle after cycle. So they're not being spun off to fight fires anywhere else. So they feel an ownership for the code base. They, they become product experts and they, what's more important, they own their technical debt. We took away the um, matrix management. So now, there's no one in those teams that, that is a line manager. The focus of those development teams is to ve develop quality code according to, Bo talked about it, the uh, product roadmap. So that is the focus. And then those things coming up oh, is what Ian is going to talk about later on, building those foundations of the DevOps uh, community and DevOps thinking, getting that DevOps thinking into the teams. So now, what, what did we learn through that? What did we communicate? So the key nutty professor in the corner is meant to, we had some help with this, didn't we? And we did. someone supported us with these images. So buy-in from the top, 
So if we're talking about Agile, if we're, if we're trying to change the way that the business is behaving and the buying from the business, then, then we need to practice what we preach. So in terms of how we deliver to the business, that needs to be iterative as well. We can't say we're going to make a change and come back in a year and it will all be better. We've got to build that, that change plan in such a way that they can see changes along the way, so in smaller increments. So in setting that vision, we also needed to be clear about when change would come along and the benefit from each of those changes. So we needed to share what was in it for the business and explain to them when we deliver benefit. We felt we had to be clear with our goals. We, we were changing working practices and changing the, the whole organization, uh, the delivery organization. So we had to be clear with our goals. If our people didn't know where we were aiming at, then, then we'd lose them. We, we knew that we had to be very clear with the goals that we were setting ourselves and our management were setting us as well. We needed to iterate, so we needed to make a decision. We then needed to test that and we, need, we needed to not be scared to fail. We also needed everyone to understand that we would fail. There was certainty in that. We would make mistakes. We wouldn't get it all right first time. And for everyone not to lose nerve in terms of is the change the right thing to do, we will make mistakes, we'll test it, we'll adapt, and we'll try again. So it, it was important that everyone understood that we are going to try things here and we will get bits of it wrong. And communicate. Tell people what's going on. Keep them in the loop. Keep people informed. But when, when you're going through a process like this, everyone knows that there are going to be gaps. But I think if people are informed and kept in the loop, then people understand and they'll come with you if you're being open with your communication of what's happening. And internally, this is Chris's biggest strength, communication. Chris tells everybody everything. <laughs> Don't tell me if so you don't want it is an to internal know. that if <laughs> you just do do not tell Chris. So some of the things that you're still just thinking about before you know it, if you pass it to Chris, everybody knows about it. So yeah, definitely no problem in terms of communication. The image in the middle is is really about getting getting exec as we talked about at the beginning, getting the leadership behind you and getting their help and support. And as as Chris said, the key turning point for us was was when Mike Gordon and David Ross joined the organization. As ex-developers, they were already bought into the vision. They just knew how quickly you're gonna get there. You've already done some of the thinking, so actually how quickly we're gonna get there. And the key is often that image can work, work in opposite ways. Someone can be pushing you back down as you're trying to get to the top, or can be pulling you up, and it's a bit corny. But genuinely, if the leadership understand where you're trying to get to, and they believe it's the right thing to do, then they will help you get there. And, and that's the key, because it's all too often you just get that pushback. Um, so having that, that joined up vision has made this an awful lot easier. And this is my favorite, the transparency, as Anne-Marie says. <laughs> I, I, I want everyone to know what's going on at all the time. So I, I struggle with myself if I'm told a secret. <laughs> right, you, you can't tell anyone, Chris, I'm, I'm struggling. I'd prefer not to know, really. But I do know. And, but if, if you've been transparent in the past and people know that you're not hiding things for the sake of it, you're, you're being transparent and you're, you're, letting, you're letting the right people know, then they also know that if you can't say things, because obviously in a transformation like this, we're talking role titles change, we're talking people moving, line management, and different jobs, different roles and responsibilities. There will be HR secrets along the way. But if you've got that reputation of transparency in everything else, when you have got secrets, people understand that you need to keep them. And when the time is right, we've got 15 minutes. When the time is right, we're able to, we're able to explain what those what those secrets are and wherever possible chris tries to stick to that <laughs> which is why Maybe. he didn't which is why he didn't get the clicker or would have been on this slide within the first five minutes <laughs> <laughs> so so the big thing is this is uh the, the the last sprint review we were doing so our dev structure as we said right at the very beginning is now around the development team it's about 
giving that development team autonomy. It's about giving them responsibility, making them accountable. Little story. So I popped into the office on the way here today, and I walked to the conference with two developers from, uh, from the Ford and ID team. And one of the developers, he's quite new, he's sitting in the front here. One, he's quite new, and uh, you know, chat, chat, conversation. I said, oh, you, you've, uh, you've been doing some good refactoring of, of the code base, haven't you? And he told me, yeah, yeah, you know, it's really good. It enables testing, and uh, um, it, it makes the code better. It's more, it's more modern practices. You know, the code base was a little bit old. And I had a, a nice, you know, that's, that's really good. He, he feels he's come into the team, and the team has empowered him to make those changes. But then, and this, this is what I, I cried. I did. I cried a little bit. For the last year, I've been talking about measure to improve. Measure stuff and display those measurements so you can learn from it. And so the other developer, Greta, said, oh, yeah, I can see the refactoring that's been going on because in SonarCube, the complexity graph is going down for that for that code base. And suddenly, the whole year just crystallized into that one minute, and I had a little cry. <gasps> I, uh, I, uh, I, I caught myself, because <laughs> that, to me, all of this, that is what it's about. That team are empowered to make those changes. It's in the code base now. It will go out to If it hasn't gone out to live already, it will be going out to live with our, with our next release within a month. But the most important thing, someone else in that team has recognized that work through uh, a, a measurement tool, the, the sonar cube static tool. And to me, that, that's, that's, that's what it's all about, the devs owning that process. But the good thing is as well, the product owners, they now, some of them, I'll let you into a secret, but you know, don't tell anyone. Some of them are, are their eyes are wide. They are realizing that they've had a bit of a cushy life over the past few years, and now they've got a, a team of developers, open, like little birds, open my, looking at them, saying, give me, prioritize that backlog. Give, I want my next task. And they're having to, to actually commit, to, to, and they own the product, and they are driving what is the next priority, and they are driving the backlog. And that, that's a good thing. That's a good thing, because they are responsible for that product in the end. It's a change. Our Scrum Masters, there, there was a, can, can, can your project management team really turn into Scrum Masters? And what we're learning is, yes, they can. They're, they're now being released to think about the method. And they're, they've been released to help coach the dev team to, to, to do the method right. Really, really important change. What else? I made some notes earlier. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Danius, in, in the, in the uh, talk through there, was talking about static code analysis. And uh, so, that, that was, that's a really important thing, that you can't do all this thing without continually measuring. You know, we, we heard from uh, Steve uh, earlier on about performance testing. The teams now... They're not, they're not all there, but the teams now see performance through every environment out to live, and, and that's ace. But I think to, to sum up, just like our development of our, of our products, we, we know we're not there yet. We, we know we're not finished. We're, we're looking for ways to, to improve. We're looking for, for, within our teams, ways to improve, ways to change. And that, that's, that's the final message, really, that we're, we're on this journey. We've got this far, but we're going we're gonna to keep going. There we are. Any questions? Questions. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, oh I, got question. Such a, question. I got such a telling off earlier. Right, I got <laughs> such a Have you met Simona here? Simona's our, our HR. And uh, so I had to buy some books as prizes for, uh, for the Agile Tour. And I got the telling off because Steve didn't ask the question in, in, his, in his talk. So we were a bit late with this question. So now hang on, I've got to get the question right. I looked it up last night. So we want, all you've got to do is visit the call credit stand 
and tell whoever's there, they'll get you to write it down, put it in the post box. So, what is the percentage of big IT projects that fail? What, what is that percentage? I don't know. Hopefully you will. And you can read the books. Do you want to see what they are? It's not a holiday. It's not a holiday or an <laughs> iPad, but it's uh, Management 3.0. It's uh, how to do with Agile retrospectives. And uh, it's how to change the world. There we are. <laughs> questions? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, you go ask some questions. Yeah. Okay. So what was the percentage? No, no. <laughs> you want those books, don't you? You want those stand. books. Yeah, I want the last one. <laughs> you want the last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because I would tell you, it. wouldn't I? I would tell you what the answer is. I forgot this. <laughs> okay, maybe somebody has the questions? Phew, see ya. <laughs> Is that it? You're on. Yeah, it's no question. Uh, it's cup of tea. Get back oh, up. We have two at once. You've spoken about past challenges and how you've overcome them. What would you see as your next biggest challenge within the, the roadmap of tra the full transformation? I think it's um, uh, in embedding the change of mentality into the product owners and the yeah. product management uh, teams. They're all in place now, they're all there, but as I said, quite, uh, you know, lo lots of them, and I can think of very specific examples, have got it, bang, they're, they are right on it. They're grooming their backlogs, they're prioritizing their, their features, they're, they're leading in those, in those sprints. But for some... Others, that's, for others, it's, it's more, of a, more of a challenge. I think what will help us massively on that is the organizational change that we've made in terms of the product managers now being aligned to our CTO space. So, and I think what will help educate, self-educate the, the, the product managers is they are building the roadmaps with the team. They are the ones communicating those roadmaps to the sellers. They are on the hook for the roadmap. So they feel the need to learn how to work with us because they are making the promises that we need to keep. So in terms of we, we have a, a, a mutual win out of this, so we have to work together. So I think it's that education which we can train all we want, but we've just got to work together in that way for some time. There was another question over there. I, I obviously want to answer oh, yeah. with the man so in the orange shirt, as I'm called orange. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So you, you said that, that at one point you had this division that developers seem to work in this more agile style, but uh, the business or sales uh, people seem to uh, look in, into this from this older perspective, sales-oriented. So, and uh, it seems that in, in the end, the developer style won. So I wonder what happened happened to salesmen. So did you go in and change their minds or did you change salesmen? <laughs> um, I think the big thing is, and it, it's, it's almost too easy a fix, and it's hard to say how easily we would have got there if it hadn't happened, but I do think CEO and CTO change, and importantly CEO change, is, is really what, what changed the culture in terms of the sales team. So actually, don't make promises that we can't keep because that, that reflects badly on all of us. Um, so I think we would have got there. I think it would have took a lot longer. I think we're getting there quicker because it's, it's coming from the top down. And it genuinely is. I think Mike, having been a developer, knows what it feels like to have a promise made on your behalf that you've no chance of achieving. Um, and that, that's not a culture that we want in the organization. So some, there were some other uh, senior appointments that, that made a big difference as well. Um, for quite a while, our live operations department was, was run by the, the, same, the same head as the, as the development. And so I think he, he, was, he was stretched quite thin across you know, two very, very different sets of priorities. And so now there's, there's a, a different sort of technical line. That definitely, definitely is... is if we're not careful, going to cause other issues in terms of a divide between our operations team and our development team. But stay for uh, Ian's uh, talk later on DevOps, and you'll, you'll hear how he's striving with his teams to, to make sure there isn't a gap or it's well bridged between. But I think, I think that has helped as well. So the focus of CTO is on product delivery. 
rather than everything technical in the business. You mentioned that you eliminated uh, people managers, or I would say line managers. Uh, so does that mean that you get rid of performance reviews or annual reviews? And if not, who does those? No, so, so we, we changed the structure subtly. So what, what we did was took line management responsibility away from the scrum teams so that they could entirely focus on driving the teams. Sat across the teams is, is, a people, is people management. In, so that does exist in the structure, but they're not actually, they're not part of the scrum team. Um, so that, that was one of the organization changes that we made. Importantly, they're aligned across two teams. So that, that helps in terms of how effective the people management can be, either for that individual managing or for, for the person being managed in terms of trying to develop their career because they're actually working alongside them. So they're actually, whilst they're not part of the scrum team, they're actually sat with those teams so they can actually see how effective um, the team's operating. Yeah, um, we felt it was very important that, um, example, in your daily stand-up, we didn't want developers, testers, to be reporting their progress to their line manager. So we wanted the line management out of that, 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 scrum, that scrum team. In terms of performance reviews, we, we haven't changed in isolation. We've made some, some big changes right the way across Core Credit as an organization. And the HR team with Simona have been working hard on the performance appraisal process. And so now, the, the appraisal process is, is more of a, a conversation between two people rather than a scoring um, against uh, uh, arbitrary objectives. It's about a discussion to talk about what you're planning on doing for the year and then a discussion of how, how you're getting on. And the, the second half of the review process is all about looking forward. So it's about short-term, medium, long-term goals of the individual and then a, a career development plan. And that, that is, is, is changing people's mindset in, in across across the whole company, and especially especially uh, in delivery, that we're we're really asking people to think about their career and think about their next steps, rather than just sailing sailing through being nudged from one job to the other. We we want people to think about where they want to go and the steps to get there. Does that answer you? Okay, we will. One more question. I see here. The last one. Hello. Uh, Hello. You have told that you have been a project driven company um, and there was a role like project managers, yeah? Yep. So, uh, what, uh, what they are now in the Agile, uh, com agile company. Um, mm, Agile company team, they are, became project uh, owners or scrum masters or they have lived uh, behind just for the responsible for the pro whole pro products? And scrum masters. I, in the main, yeah, yes, they've, they've scrum become masters. scrum masters. We've, we've changed their focus and we've, we've, we've usually changed their, their responsibilities. But that's not to say we haven't still got projects within the company. Um, our more, we, we've, got, we've got different services that are more customer driven and our, those customers want a team to deliver projects. And so we've still got project managers facing, facing external customers doing, doing projects, but the vast majority of the, of the PMs that stayed within the delivery space have turned yeah. into uh, Scrum Masters. Yeah. Two, two move to be um, people, managers, we call them yep. product development managers, and not wanting to do that role, a little bit of a disservice in terms of the value that it adds to the business. About 50% of the role, and probably reducing, is, is classed as, as people management and people development. But because they're closely aligned to the teams, then it's not the overhead that it is when you're doing matrix management, because you, you're actually you, you're closely aligned to the team. Yep. The other 50% of the role is, is around strategic direction for that team, so working with our software architects and enterprise architects and, and product owners in terms of more medium to long term view for the team. So they will face back into the team and face outwards into, into the broader organisation in terms of what that team needs to be addressing 
in more medium to long term. So if we know what roadmap changes are coming, then they need to look inwards and say what skills do the team need and make sure that the team are trained in time such that they can meet that, that upcoming demand. So, so that role is, is a, a split between people management and, and it's the senior role in terms of our leadership team in terms of its, its long-term planning. And the, the, adding to that, the important part, that sort of, that other strategic planning was a lot of the stuff that we used to get the developers leads to do. And so, you know, they were trying to people manage, they were trying to deliver on their, on their projects, but they were also trying to improve and do, and do business change. And so lifting that out, the, the development teams are far more focused now in terms of their, their, their iterating product delivery. I think we've got our warning. Okay, I believe we have the last question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, by the way, one more question. Oh. You were talking about transparency. I guess Chris is more transparent than Anne, so I'm going <laughs> to ask you one more question. <laughs> Who knows the answer to win the book? But, the buzz. but, but Chris would tell you. I wouldn't. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Give them best applause. <laughs> thank you. And before you leave, I have our small presents for you. Thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you what it is because if we've all been sitting there saying, "What have they been given? What have they been given?" What? Well, it's a towel. It's a towel with agile tool. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>